Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this episode of the Animal Care System Science-Based Webinar Series. I'm your host, Austin Carell. Today's presenter is Dr. David W. Brammer. Dr. Brammer earned his veterinary degree from Texas A&M University and completed his residency in laboratory animal medicine at the University of Michigan. Dr. Brammer is the Executive Director of Animal Care Operations at the University of Houston. He is an expert in continuous process improvement using solutions based on the analysis of collected data. He regularly presents to audiences at the national level and consults within the academic, pharmaceutical, and architectural industries. Animal Care Systems is thrilled to host Dr. Brammer's webinar today. The title of his seminar is A Stitch in Time Saves Nine. If you have a question for Dr. Brammer, please use the question pane in the control panel and we will answer as many questions as we can after the seminar. Dr. Brammer, I now turn the audience to you. Very good, awesome. Thanks for that kind introduction. We'll move right to the seminar. And today I'll be presenting a, a stitch in time, stage nine. And at this time we'll go over in the next few minutes uh, uh, just exactly how the University of Houston uses uh, lean management in the, in the animal care operations itself. And then we will look at specifically how the Optimize and how the OptiRat system is uh, key to this effort. Move right through here. This is my contact information. I'll be glad to help you in any way uh, uh, after this seminar. I'm going to briefly just go over a, uh, an overview of lean management, and this will give you an idea of the overall process for implementing lean management into your operation. Uh, if we look at this as a uh, as a graphic of a house, lean management overall would be the roof. And at the very bottom, the continuous improvement is the foundation for everything. We want to do things. We want to do things better tomorrow. We want to do things a whole lot better by the by this time next year. We can divide this up into several different areas: the workplace organization, the problem-solving tools, and also the inventory control. Each one of those is vital, and we can spend a seminar on each one of those. We use several of those tools. Uh, Throughout our system, we mainly use the 5S process. We also use quite a bit of uh, problem solving and, uh, uh, and inventory control. We'll just go over those briefly as we continue. But I'd just like to warn everybody, once you begin implementing these types of systems and these types of tools into your program, you're gonna get a culture change and that is what's gonna be required. There's gonna be some struggles that you have to work through, uh, but eventually I think it'll be a positive uh, aspect for your department. Workplace organization, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but it is key to getting your place uh, organized. Uh, uh, sorting is your first key. Uh, you would like to uh, take everything and sort it out and get rid of everything that is not needed for the workplace. At that time, then you would, and this may take uh, a day, it may take several months. You'll need to set everything in order, placing that in the location where it is used and uh, making sure that it has, uh, uh, has, has a place to reside and is, is used only in that place. Uh, the next is shine. Everybody likes to move from, short, uh, from uh, sorting to shining, but that is not the correct order. Shine uh, doesn't necessarily mean it, it has to look pretty, but it actually has to work and it also has to label uh, be labeled so that everybody knows where to replace that piece of equipment once it is completed. And then the next thing in order is standardized. We'd like to have the same cleaning agent, same uh, paper towel. We have to have the same spray bottle. We want to be able to just train on one or two pieces of equipment and, and then have a good knowledge of how this is used throughout the entire department. And finally, the most important part of that is sustain. So that's when you go right back to sort, take a look at the things that you had left in place and make sure that those are still important for the functions of that area. And then move right back down to set in order shine and then uh, standardize once again. 
the, the difference between the 5S program and spring cleaning is, is actually the fifth step, and that's sustain. If you're not going to sustain this, you're going to have to assume that you're going to do this whole thing over again uh, in the spring, cleaning out everything that shouldn't have been put in there in the first place. So the 5S workplace is important. Once you start implementing the 5S workplace, uh, we start uh, putting uh, uh, these principles in place. This is actually a sign that we have in one of our storerooms. It says no location and no label is no storage. So if you order something, you need to know where to store it. You need to know, uh, everyone else needs to know that too. Once uh, you begin putting things in place, your storeroom begins to uh, have locations and things begin to uh, set up uh, and once you put labels on things, pe people begin putting things back into uh, the area that they uh, were labeled. So uh, we use uh, simple labels. This is actually a water bottle label. I'm, I'm sorry, a spray bottle label that we've actually placed on the sink and just magically that spray bottle will move back towards that label. A uh, key component of lean management is actually labeling the floor, making sure you know where clean paths are, make sure you know where things can be uh, placed. And then finally, your cabinetry look, will look like this. Everything on the cabinet should have a label underneath it. So once you once you pick up something, it should have what a label that demonstrates what is supposed to be in that place. And it also has another label that demonstrates where the X uh, where additional inventory is located. A supervisor can walk into any of these rooms, look for labels, determine almost instantly what needs to be uh, restocked. So this is what a 5S workplace looks like after you uh, go through this entire exercise several times. Process flow. Process flow gets the entire group involved. And this is uh, just, these are just two examples of what process flow can look like. Uh, the second one is really what we've roughed out on a uh, dry erase board. The first one is an example of what we've done once we place this into a uh, electronic version. Process flow allows you to demonstrate exactly what is being done, what the sequential steps are, and then, then you can uh, uh, put forth an effort to streamline those uh, processes. These will be very important, and I'll show you how we use this with the optimized system in the future. Uh, standardization. We use a lot of standardization and these are our visual workplace uh, graphics that are used throughout the uh, uh, department here. Different colors are targeting different audiences. So, um, this is just a simple uh, uh, graphic. These will all have eight different uh, uh, graphics associated with them. Most people will read up to eight charts like this. They won't read much more than that. If you can, if you can design your uh, visual workplace in less than eight, then that is great. These are just some a few of the examples that we use. This last one is a healthcare, uh, our health condition uh, for the mouse facility, and Charles River Laboratory came through our facility, observed this, and asked if they could uh, put this in, uh, make this available. For everyone, you can actually get this on the uh, Charles River website even today. This was in conjunction with MD Anderson uh, that we uh, put together this project. The bin system is really the one of the final things that we've done to control inventory. All of our inventory has now been converted to just in time. We no longer order things. We have established a steady state inventory system where all items, all PPE items are placed in bins. As the bin is emptied out, then that is placed at an elevator and the vendor comes in, uh, removes the bins, takes them to their warehouse and returns the next week with full bins associated with that. This has allowed us to save all of the hassle associated with ordering. No one has to order uh, any, any goods now or any PPE. And, we essentially gained an entire admin staff in our office just simply by converting to this one system. All PPE is used out of the bin system. Replacement is once again steady state. You're never, you're never having to order bulk or you're never having to, to skip an order in 
this is entirely different than having a standing order. Uh, no orders, no one orders, we all gained uh, one admin staff. And so uh, the, one of the advantages also, we've asked the vendor to remove all the plastic and cardboard so we're not uh, burdened with the hassle of uh, recycling all of this. And this is a, you know, just another warning that uh, the culture change is required to get to this step. So how does, uh, how do we use the optimized system in our uh, lean management efforts? And one way is that simply not looking at the optimized tower as a place to put mice. Um, this is what you'll find on the ACS website. It's a nice picture, it's a nice tower, it has a hundred boxes on that uh, tower. Uh, but really what we use this is, is a multi-purpose tower. And, and we call that multi-purpose is because this is what it replaced in our animal facility. This is a universal transport cart. The universal transport cart we commonly or historically we use to grab mouse boxes or lids or feeders and take them to the animal rooms and change out. But now what we do is in the clean side cage wars, we build our towers uh, with clean, with the, uh, uh, we build our towers with uh, rat, rat or mouse boxes. And then we transport using that multi-purpose tower, clean cages to the animal room, change clean to dirty and remove the dirty cages from the animal rooms using the Optimize uh, tower, OptiRat tower. This, uh, uh, this system was driven by our needs in cage wash. In our cage wash, what we found is using the old system where we use the uh, transport carts, the transport carts would be taken back to the dirty side cage wash and all the cages would be unstacked onto the floor and then we would cut in line and, and wash all of the transport uh, uh, carts as a priority. So about half the time in the rack washer itself, we were not washing cages, we were actually washing uh, these uh, transport carts so we could actually take something back to the animal room. This was an enormous waste of uh, time and we found that simply converting over to the uh, use of the multi-purpose optimized tower, we eliminated not only the transport carts, but we also eliminated the uh, uh, time spent in our cage uh, wash facility. And you can see some of the advantages that we have here. It, it allowed us to really convert uh, the uh, optimized tower into a place to store cages with mice. We use a just-in-time inventory system as well for our cages. Uh, the cages that are washed one day will be used the next day or, or, or at least in the, if it's Friday, they'll be used on Monday. So we don't have a lot of cages sitting around our cage wash itself. And the, finally, the best thing that we found uh, was that we were able to move these mice during an emergency. And here in Houston, we have an occasional hurricane that causes everyone to, to uh, need to be prepared. And I'll show you some of the preparation efforts that we had and, the, and I'll outline what happened during the Hurricane Harvey. This is just a picture of the dirty side cage wash. And you can see on the right, that's a dump station. In the far background, that's a universal wash rack. And then on the left is the simple optimized tower a staff member can actually stand in between all three of those uh, uh, pieces of, of uh, equipment and then move from the optimized tower, picking up a dirty cage, dumping it, and then placing the lid at the top of the universal wash rack, the feeder inside the, the mouse box, and then the feeder and the mouse box go in the final three rows of that. So this allows our staff member not to have to walk around very much in the cage wash area. And it also allows us to bring in the dirty cages on the towers and move them directly to the dump station. We would then wash everything through a wash cycle. It takes about 15 minutes to dump 100 boxes. It takes about eight minutes to wash 
uh, cages through this uh, uh, cage wash itself. We can wash 60 lids and 60 feeders, and we've tried for years to try to get a, a rack to wash 100 racks, uh, 100 boxes, 100 lids. We have not solved that problem yet. If you simply do the math, we can run and easily prepare uh, three towers per hour. <clears throat> that allows us to produce about 600 cages in two hours time frame. If we spread that over five days a week, we can we can easily handle a, a facility for 3,000 cages of mice uh, using the cage wash uh, uh, for about two hours a day. If you if you were able to push that out to a 14-day change-out time frame, you can handle a 6,000 cage animal facility by simply devoting two hours of cage wash time to uh, mouse, uh, the mouse uh, cage preparation. <clears throat> this is what clean side cage wash looks like, and you see in the very back and also in the forefront, the optimized uh, towers that have uh, mouse cages on them. The, this is set up so that actually two people can build off the universal wash racks, but what you see that in this picture is that uh, there is a, a outline space in green tape. And we'd have a staff member stand between essentially those two universal wash racks. They'd be able to pick up a lid off the top row, a mouse box and a mouse cage. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a mouse cage and a, uh, and a feeder, snap those together and snap those on the Optimize tower itself. It takes about 15 minutes to, to build a tower itself. We do not place bedding in the, in the cages. Uh, at this time, we use a, uh, a wafer, a fiber wafer or a, a, a cotton wafer that is placed in the cage during the cage change out. And that allows us to be very efficient in our uh, animal. Uh, it, that allows us to be very efficient in our uh, building of cages in the clean side cage wash, but it also allows us to be very efficient in our uh, changing of the mouse cages itself. And this is what a cage looks like when you're storing storing it without mouse, mice. This is in our clean side cage wash. It's a complete tower sitting around waiting uh, for tomorrow and tomorrow we'll be placing this back in our system itself. This is a, a good example of just-in-time inventory. We're not preparing more cages than we need and we're trying to trying our best to even out our cage wash uh, Monday th through Friday. Clean cages and we clean cages and we use them the next day or you know maybe the following day if it's a little bit irregular in our in our change outs. Uh, and the biggest question we always get is what happens when cage wash is down? <clears throat> you must not have many cages for that. Well the, the answer is we actually do <clears throat> because on that day we would have already changed our cages. We wouldn't have discovered cage washes down until the afternoon or, or maybe late morning when we actually get into the cage wash area. We do not have a staff that works in the cage wash full time. So we would have already changed cages for that day. We'll call, we have a pretty good response from our cage wash uh, uh, time frame or our cage wash techs. And then we simply, uh, we simply do something else on the list, and I'll try to show you all that. Uh, we have uh, outlined about 38 things in our animal facilities that we do, and uh, that that is just something else that we'll do while we're waiting for cages to be processed. So how do you get to the point where you change our uh, cages uh, uh, efficiently like this? And I'll have to show you this. Uh, this is really everything that is needed in a process flow chart of how to change the cage. You need to gather your material, you need to determine if you're using a single or dual side change out system, and then these are the process steps that we're going through until you've uh, changed the mouse into a clean cage. And on the right is the uh, what you would find in the animal room. This is the biosafety cabinet. 
with a light on and at the uh, in the forefront you have a cage or you have a uh, a, a, a cart and that cart has a set of feed on that cart and then you would have a dirty and a clean rack available the staff person can stay within this small confined space and change out 100 boxes uh, pretty rapidly not having to leave that particular space, not having to go get additional equipment or not having to, to move from this particular area, only spinning or changing the, the uh, configuration of the mouse towers. We keep our bedding in one box of the, of the tower itself. It's usually in J8 or 9. We also keep Sentinels in J10. In the other spot, we will keep this box of feed. And that allows us to provide feed and bedding for that tower alone. If an investigator needs to split a cage, you can always get bedding, you can always get feed that's available on that tower itself. We lose uh, a couple cages per tower, but by far we it allows us to streamline our efforts and that uh, uh, cage of food is actually trans transfer, the food in that cage is actually transferred to the next box the next week so we end up washing all of our mouse uh, feed boxes every week this is a typical configuration of one of our largest animal rooms we have several animal rooms this size you can see on the floor there's a uh, location or spaces available for the optimize cage to um, be located we have automatic watering there then obviously on the edge of the uh, facility or the edge of the room, we have our biosafety cabinets that the investigators work in. Oh, and this is this slide's a little bit out of order, and I apologize for that. This is what we do when cage washes down. This is a Pareto chart of all the all of the uh, uh, tasks that are available to be done in the animal. Uh, uh, facility. Uh, the far left uh, uh, is actually the two two items that are done in cage wash. The remaining items are, are just simple tasks that, that need to be performed. The, the gray bars indicate the amount of time needed to perform these tasks and all these tasks are aligned from left to right using the, the most amount of time to the least amount of time. The green line is an accumulation of the percentage of time from the from all of the previous uh, all of the tasks that are listed to the left. And if you take a look at that, this is uh, and what we try to focus on is the 80 percent rule or 80 20 rule. Or um, most people are familiar with that, but that really comes from the Pareto chart itself. The 80 20 rule indicates that you would work on all the items listed under the 80 percent and ignore or never try to gain efficiency in any of the items listed in the 20 percent area so there's an entire seminar associated with this and how to how to create these how to how to use them and how to stay on task when you uh, put everything in the pareto chart so planning you know we end up planning quite a number of different things and this is the one thing that we plan for here in Texas. And this is Hurricane Harvey. I'm sure everyone remembers that. We remember it fairly well down here. Hurricane Harvey formed in the, in the Gulf uh, between here and the Yucatan Peninsula. It formed pretty rapidly on about a Monday night or a Tuesday. And by Friday, that thing was uh, pushing up on the shoreline here in Houston. Most of the time we watch these hurricanes as they come off the west coast of Africa and they kind of wander across the, the Atlantic and we wonder where they're going to hit. This thing actually sh showed up uh, pretty rapidly uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Gulf. It never really traveled into the Gulf. Uh, this hurricane was pretty devastating for the city of Houston. We received about 52 inches of rain in a little over a 24 hour period. And we're about uh, 45, 45 miles inland. So we had about over four 
and a half feet, almost four and a half feet of water that had to drain out into the Gulf. So there was enormous amount of flooding. And uh, as luck would have it, one of our animal facilities here is in the basement. And we'll just go over a few things there. You know, uh, we did not lose any mice and we did not lose any rats or anything out of that basement. We were able to evacuate them actually on a Friday morning. And that uh, hurricane hit about Friday night at about 11 o'clock. So this is what we did. On the morning of Hurricane Harvey, you remember we we were very accustomed to uh, uh, using these towers to transport cages. We just transported cages now with mice in them. To make things more efficient, what we had to do is we consolidated the towers. There's all of our towers are not at maximum capacity, so we we pushed uh, all the towers onto all the mouse cages onto as few towers as we could. What that allowed us to do is we moved about 17 towers out of the basement facility. Uh, several of those were rats, the majority of those were mice. We bring these out of an elevator, put them up uh, onto a dock, transfer them onto our animal care operations truck. Uh, that truck uh, Intel uh, in total will hold six towers at a time. We transport those across the campus, unload them uh, onto another dock, take them up five uh, uh, stories and we place them on the fifth story uh, animal facility. Uh, each round trip of that truck took uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and we were able to unload all those uh, mice from about six o'clock in the morning to about uh, 12 o'clock or about noon. The next thing we do is we grab all of our pallets to feed, move those either over here and move them to a higher point in the in the uh, primary existing building. And then we moved all of our PPE. As you remember, all of our PPE was located on the bins. So it didn't take much time to grab all the PPE that we needed and move it right over. And in hindsight, we probably never needed to move the PPE because no one was here except the ride out team. And then we moved all the clean towers to the upper floor of the original building. And then, uh, you know, finally, no rats or mice were lost during the Hurricane Harvey. So once again, we had developed over the course of the years the ability to move these rats and mice uh, cages throughout our facility using the optimized tower and then or the Opti rat tower. This gave us confidence to be able to move those things up and down the hallway without dropping boxes and things like that. Uh, we had prepared for the hurricane knowing that, uh, knowing exactly how many uh, cages would be uh, be able to halt and be able to be uh, transported on one truck and that allowed us to be able to safely transport all the rats and mice out of the hurricane uh, out of the basement that was endangered by the uh, hurricane itself. The next day after Hurricane Harvey, it's always the next day, we returned to the basement which had water in it, but not very much. We returned and gave, grabbed a little bit more supplies, some of the cleaning supplies. Uh, we returned for the clean towers that we had stashed on the higher floors of that building, transporting them in the same uh, truck that we did the previous day. We returned and got the biosafety cabinets because it became obvious that the, the uh, uh, that, that basement was not gonna be used for a while. So we pulled all the biosafety cabinets out and then we were able to convert our new, new facility or our, our existing facility in uh, on the fifth floor of the new building into the primary uh, facility for all rats and mice on the campus. So at this time, I, you know, I wanted to uh, also offer you a couple of suggestions on lean management. Lean management is a process and it's you can read about it, but you really have to learn it. Uh, way of learning that comes in several different ways. One of the best ways is actually go and see how this is done at other locations. Uh, there is an organization, the Vivarium Operational Excellence Network. It's a, it is a group of uh, people in the laboratory animal industry that uses lean management. It allows you to network within the lab animal industry and they know uh, 
they know about the industry, they know about how to solve problems associated or specifically for you. And it's also a way of starting your training for the uh, continuous improvement culture. You can receive a white belt or a yellow belt that allows you to start using the same language and it allows you to, to uh, make some progress on your lean, uh, in your lean culture. So I'll go through some questions for you now. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, but you know, in summary, we just wanted to, I just want to show you exactly how we use the optimized tower, the Opti rat tower to transport cages throughout the uh, animal facility that allows us to gain access uh, to our cage wash uh, rack washer. And that allowed us to wash a whole lot less universal transport carts and allowed us to streamline our processes through there and allowed us to uh, uh, in the end be able to use the, these two types of towers to uh, transport our mice out of harm's way out of a basement during a hurricane. I'll turn it over to Austin. Thank you very much Dr. Brammer. We have several questions from the audience. The first question is do you autoclave the cages on the tower before entering animal rooms? Uh, we we routinely do not autoclave the, the uh, cages and they go into the animal rooms unless they are going into an animal room uh, for immunodeficient mice. And for instance, we would we don't have any immunodeficient rats, so none of the rat cages are autoclaved. Um, just a garden variety. A uh, mouse does not get an autoclave cage. Uh, it does get irradiated feed, it does get irradiated bedding, uh, uh, but it does, we do not autoclave anything unless it is required to be autoclaved for the health of the animal. Dr. Brammer, here's the next question. How is the multi-purpose tower washed once the cages on it are sent through the cage washer? Yeah, we use a rack washer for the majority of our washing needs and specifically in the basement, we only had a, a rack washer. So uh, once a universal wash rack comes out and there's two Opti mice or Opti rat towers on the dirty side cage wash, they're fed right into that rack washer and there's a rack wash uh, cycle. So you should be able to wash two, two uh, optimized towers at the same time. We will keep empty towers on the clean side cage wash side. That way when you start dumping cages and you run your first uh, universal wash rack through with the lids and the boxes and the feet uh, feeders, then you have something to stack your, uh, you have something to build onto. So we will uh, I didn't show that in the slide, but we do keep a couple of those towers on the clean side cage wash just to make processing a little bit easier. Dr. Brammer, here's the next question. Are the towers unhooked from the exhaust at cage changing time? You know, some of them are, some of them are not. It depends on how far they have to be moved, but we're going to change out that rack eventually uh, from all the uh, all of the clean, uh, all the dirty boxes are going to be uh, emptied out of mice and placed on the, the new box. So we would switch over at that time from the original dirty box to the to the new clean uh, tower, from the original dirty tower to the to the new clean tower at that time. We we're not going to spend a lot of time changing out those cages. I mean, it does not take. Uh, I didn't show you the data, but dual side change out uh, is obviously a whole lot quicker uh, uh, than the single side change out, but we expect our animal uh, care to change out uh, those things uh, pretty promptly. I, and I don't, I don't recall the time frame that's needed for that. Okay, Dr. Brammer, here's the next question. Did you wrap each tower in something before moving them onto the trucks during transportation? We did not. We just pushed those things right on the truck uh, and uh, we did drop a few uh, cage cards and that led to a scavenger hunt and, a, and some creative uh, moments to realign the, uh, the boxes uh, with the correct cage cards. 
we do have a, uh, a system that has an RFID tag uh, as a cage card holder. And we were able to, to uh, relocate those, the cage card using the original barcode with the uh, a cage uh, card holder RFID system. Dr. Brammer, here's the next question. Can you clarify the type of bedding you utilize and when it is added to the cages? Is the wafer the bedding itself or enrichment? Uh, yes, I can. <clears throat> we use a uh, cotton wafer or cotton fiber wafer that is placed in the cage during the cage change out. There's several types out there. I, I want to try to avoid recommending or not recommending a, a particular type. I encourage you to take a look at all of the wafers uh, that are available or the pads that are available and see what works for you. Uh, you can, all these pads that we've used, we use several different types uh, uh, and they're all available irradiated. Uh, so you can simply pull those out knowing it's a sterile product, placing that in the cage itself. Over the next several days, the uh, uh, the mouse will uh, use that as uh, uh, and begin uh, landscaping that, building great big nest in there, and having uh, 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 you know just having a great time with that. So it is an enriched environment for them. We do not have to place a nestlet of any type in the mouse box itself. The rats will not do anything with those cotton wafers, uh, and we use a different type of bedding for them. We place nesting material in there for them. Couple more questions, Dr. Brammer. You know, I would I would just say if we move to the the cotton bedding, uh, the nesting building is a learned behavior. So the first week or two you're using it, uh, you may not see much nesting uh, develop. But if a mouse is uh, raised in that particular environment and uh, it's given birth and they and they eventually learn to use that uh, over the course of the next several months, you have a lot of nest building behavior that develops that is not present during the first week. So, next question, Dr. Bramer. How long can an opti cage be taken off a rack or with animals in it? You know, I, uh, I'll tell you what we have done. We've actually had our HVAC fail, so exhaust systems go down, and we've had those mice uh, a little over 18 hours before we get them back up and going. So. I would tell you I'm not too worried about that for 18 hours. Okay. What do you use to mark the floors with? Do you have any problem with it peeling off of the floor and or leaving an adhesive residue? Uh, we we buy those uh, tags right out of Granger, and those are standard. Uh, those are standard uh, lined. Uh, uh, outlines that you can get they are they have tapered edges and they will resist peeling and they, and they become quite difficult to pull up so uh, these are designed for warehouses they're designed so that forklifts can roll over the top of them without peeling them up and yes you're going to get some residue on there uh, and around that but i'm not too, we're not too worried about that you may have seen some slides but it looks like uh, there was some residue around it but uh, simply looking Granger, simply look in uh, uh, some of the uh, industrial uh, 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 websites and uh, floor markers are pretty readily available in a variety of colors. And I would tell you to take in, and use that as a resource. We end up using the red uh, floor labels in biohazard areas. We also use that in the dirty side cage wash. The green we use in the normal ABSL1 type areas so that if you're in an area and you recognize you're in, in the green area, you don't have to have additional PPE on. So we use the colors as part of our uh, part of our workplace uh, visual workplace management system. Dr. Brammer, do research staff adhere easily to your lean methodology? Oh no, they don't do that. So what what happens is. <laughs> There will be some resistance, but they will event, eventually begin to appreciate the organization and the cleanliness of that of that system. I don't uh, demand, and I don't 
I don't go into their laboratory demanding that they convert to a, a lean management uh, system. What it does is it allows us to uh, uh, put out a uh, put out a, a, uh, a clean environment, put out a standardized environment, and put out a uh, environment that is labeled and easily uh, put back in place. And then you will develop a peer pressure, and that peer pressure allows that environment to exist. So you don't have to go in and reprimand and demand and, and punish to get things back in place. It just simply becomes a nice peer pressure uh, advancement. And then uh, you will get more and more compliance out of our out of your investigators as you go along. But once you start changing what an investigator wants to do or thinks he has to do, you're going to get some pushback and resistance. But I think overall, if as long as you uh, as long as you bring forth that that idea is not your idea, but bring forth as a standard uh, industrial uh, well recognized system like lean management, then that'll that'll uh, be more easily uh, more easily accepted by the uh, by the investigators itself. But this is not a system that. That is easily implemented without uh, without resistance. Dr. Brammer, among all the challenges, is there a single biggest challenge that you could identify when you were getting through the culture change at your facility? Well, the culture change is going to come from your staff itself. Some have, uh, some will readily adopt this, and some will say, "No, no, we can't do that because we've always done it this way before." You you have to keep reminding them that. Uh, that you know it may not have been that that glorious uh, back in the old days uh, because they tend to complain about that uh, the way it was <laughs> uh, back then. The biggest challenge you're going to get is buy-in. So you have to go slow. That's why I start with the 5S program. The 5S program allows you to uh, just give uh, uh, give uh, opportunity to the staff to throw away stuff that is no longer needed. And then you, the next thing you were going to end up doing is uh, put forth the process flow analysis. And it's an interesting exercise to do this in a group, but we found it more interesting to do this individually, asking someone uh, individually how they changed down a mouse box or how they changed the process and allowing each of the people that, that have that task assigned to them to outline the process and then we would end up moving over to the supervisors and we asked the supervisors, how, how do your staff actually change mouse boxes? And for as many people as you have, that is how many processes you will start with. And then you have to really put that on the board and start as a group. Okay, what do we do first? What do we need? And then you begin streamlining that, allowing, the, allowing everyone the opportunity to make suggestions and explain. So everybody... Uh, everybody becomes their own uh, creative uh, solution. Uh, if you have a bunch of staff members who don't want to bring forth solutions, that's fine. But if you have some who say, I, you know, I think I can make a difference, I think this is a, some suggestions that would be important and, and provide a continuous improvement, then that, that's, uh, that allows them the audience, allows them the tool to make that difference. You have to implement the continuous improvement, and that means today we are good. Tomorrow we're going to be better, and we're going to be, we'll continue to be excellent. Uh, some people believe that you know the strive for, for perfection is is uh, is uh, is useless, and and I would agree with them. We're not be, trying to be perfect. What we're trying to do is be better today than we were yesterday. So the quest for continuous improvement is a driving force that's been successful in. In our organization here, it's been successful in many of the manufacturing organizations, and, and it's not just a place for uh, to uh, to be copied. It's actually a tool to be learned so that you can use this in the in the future. It doesn't just work at small organizations; it works at big organizations. Look at Toyota Manufacturing, uh, the largest manufacturing uh, facilities in the U.S., and they have a massive uh, system there and a massive infrastructure that can be controlled, it can be organized, and it can be uh, made efficient just by simply using some of these lean management tools. Dr. Brammer, last question. How often do you change the OptiFilters on the individual cages? 
Yes, that's a good question. And we, we've actually gone through about three different types of filters here. Uh, we initially started with a pleated filter, then there was a pleated filter with a screen in front, and now we have a flat filter. And that flat filter we've changed over universally. And using that rack washer, we had a little bit of trouble with uh, residue building up based on the way we washed those cages. And uh, we used to point those filters up and down, and that would allow accumulation of water and some residue in that, in that uh, flat filter. Uh, once we did that, uh, we, we actually had to switch our cage orientation. So we placed the filters from left to right, and uh, that has eliminated our need to change out that. Our first set of filters, the pleated filters, lasted for years. And I, it was amazing uh, the length of time that we had on those. Once we moved to the flat filters and our cage configuration in the wash cycle, uh, we changed those about a, at, a, at a one year basis. And then uh, we've uh, changed that configuration yet and once again, changing it from side to side, the filter location on the side to side. We have not changed those in over a year. So the answer is it varies depending on what type of filter you have. Well, th thank you, Dr. Brammer, once again for the seminar. And stay tuned for information about our upcoming webinars. And until then, we hope you keep up the good science. Take care.